We say a very good afternoon from Israel to Inat Wilf. Hello, Inat. Hello, Johnny. It's very nice to have you on the show, and thank you very much indeed for your time. Um, I'm asking everyone to follow you on X, on Twitter, at Inat Wilf, because you talk with such succinctness, such clarity about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which is arresting. Can you explain to our audience, to our dear listener and viewer, what it is at the heart of your arguments that embraces all kinds of positions? Certainly, and thank you. At the heart of the conflict is essentially a conflict of ideas that have become identities. Uh, I grew up in the Israeli peace camp. I used to and I still support uh, the idea of two states for two peoples, that Jews and Arabs, Israelis and Palestinians would be best served by governing themselves in their own separate political entities. I voted and supported every Israeli leader who proposed uh, to reach peace by means of two states for two peoples. And I've also by now lived enough to see how again and again, given concrete, clear opportunities for Palestinians to have their own state. We're talking most recently in 2000, 2008, even in uh, 2014, Arafat, Abu Mazen faced clear, concrete opportunities to have their own state, which means that the military presence, what people call the occupation, would be over. There would be no settlements. They were going to be dismantled or exchanged for equivalent land. There was going to be a capital in East Jerusalem, including parts of the old city. So all the things that over the years we've been told are the causes of the conflict, are the obstacles to peace, settlements, occupation, East Jerusalem, they were all on the table. And yet again and again, Palestinians walked away and followed it with murderous massacres. October 7th is not the first. There's a history of massacres and brutality. And they were often fo uh, followed. They often came after opportunities for peace. So I, like many Israelis, began to ask a simple question. What do Palestinians want? And through meeting Palestinians and working on the research that became the book, The War of Return, I realized that to their credit, they always told us what they wanted. We just didn't listen, or when we did listen, we didn't take it seriously. What they wanted, and they said it very clearly, from the river to the sea, from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea, no Jewish state in any borders whatsoever. And they have been consistent in this view for a century. Uh, going back, as you know, one of my favorite quotes as I was doing the research for the book is by the British Foreign Minister, Ernst Bevin, from February 1947. Before there's a state of Israel, before there is a war, before there are refugees, before occupation, before settlements, before all the things we are told are the problem, the British foreign minister describes the conflict as follows. He says, his majesty's government has come to the conclusion that the conflict in the land is irreconcilable. And he describes how the two groups, the peoples, the nations of the land, the Jews and the Arabs, it's clear that they are peoples and nations, not a religion. He says they each have a top priority, the thing they value above everything else. And he says, for the Jews, the top priority, the point of principle, is to establish a state. So the Jews want a state. They want sovereignty. They want to be masters of their own fate. He says, for the Arabs, the top priority, and listen to this, he says, for the Arabs, the top priority is for the Jews not to have a state in any part of the land. And it's their top priority. Their top priority is not to have their own state. He's not saying the Jews want a state, the Arabs want a state, we just don't know where to put the border. 
He says, as a matter of top priority, the Jews want a state and the Arabs want the Jews not to have a state. And those are the Arabs that are later called the Palestinians. So this is the conflict. And like you said, it's actually quite simple. It's a conflict is, has always been, between the Jewish people wanting a state, Zionism, and the Arabs, the Palestinians, wanting as a matter of top priority for the Jewish people not to have a state, anti-Zionism. That's the conflict, and that's why, by definition, it was already in February 47 irreconcilable. And this is why the Jewish people accept partition and generation after generation continue to offer various opportunities for Palestinian statehood because we care about having our own state and that's what we want. But again and again, Palestinians reject all plans to have their own state if it means that the Jewish state gets to stay because that's their top priority, no Jewish state which means, given your vision of peace, the only way we can ever get to peace is for the destruction of the Jewish state to no longer be the top priority of the Palestinians. And for that, of course, like you mentioned, we need broader support from the West, from the Arab world, from the East, for them to send a message to Palestinians to say, if you want to build your state, next to the Jewish state, we're with you, we'll help you, we'll fund you, we'll give you whatever you want to build a thriving, prosperous state. But if you continue to mobilize as a matter of top priority that the Jewish people will not have their state, then we're not with you, we're not going to help you. And only when Palestinians understand that they do not have support for their from the river to the sea ideology, can we begin to actually move to peace? Enat, thank you for that succinct and detailed reply. Can we now expand on that discussion? And you tweeted recently, the question therefore should not be who should rule Gaza when this war ends, but rather what ideology they will hold. Palestinian leaders who will clearly say Gaza is Palestine, therefore none of us in Gaza are refugees from Palestine, you tweet. Gaza is our home and will remain our home. We have no right of return into the sovereign territory of today's State of Israel. We have no ambitions to liberate Palestine from the river to the sea. We seek only to develop Gaza for the benefit of its inhabitants. We recognize the right of the Jewish people to self-determination in this land and seek only to live in peace next to the Jewish State of Israel and not instead of it. Is that the reason, do you think, Enat, why Gaza was never self-respected? Why, when Israel withdrew in 2005, uh, Gaza was never invested in by people of goodwill, that they really thought, right, this is our temporary place before we invade and destroy Israel? Isn't it now time for responsible Palestinian leadership to build their homelands in Gaza and parts of the West Bank. Precisely. October 7th was basically decades in the making. You have the vast majority of Gaza's residents, even now into the fifth generation, believing that they are still refugees from a war that supposedly ended more than seven decades ago. They believe that it is their noble duty to liberate Palestine from the river to the sea. So when this is the dominant ideology, and that is the ideology of essentially everyone in Gaza, you don't have dissenting voices. You do have people who hate Hamas, who think they brought ruin, who that they're corrupt, that they're too uh, fanatically religious. But you actually don't have dissenting voices in Gaza on the fact that the noble goal of the Palestinians is to liberate Palestine from the river to the sea. So when this is the dominant ideology, when people believe it with all their being, and then they control territory. Israel left completely in 2005. Israel actually already left 80% of Gaza in the 90s. But when they have territory, they look at this territory and they don't say, 
oh, we're going to use the billions and billions of dollars of aid money that flows and billions of dollars have gone into Gaza per capita, four times the Marshall Plan. They don't look at all these resources and say, we're going to make Gaza into a beautiful example what a pro of what a prosperous Palestinian state could be. We're going to use Gaza as literally a launch pad to liberate, to take back in their mind, Palestine from the river to the sea. So what happens when this is the reigning ideology, when this is the priority, then every dollar that goes into Gaza, every liter of fuel, every part, every uh, cement, everything that goes into Gaza, goes into turning Gaza into a highly effective war machine because the priority is to turn Gaza into a launch pad to take Palestine from the river to the sea. So when people talk now, how can we reconstruct Gaza? We want to help the people of, of Gaza. Every dollar that flows now, every fuel that flows now, and certainly everything that will go into Gaza once the war ends. If there is no effort to change the ideology, then we will again have a Gaza that is being turned into a launch pad, into a war machine. So before every dollar flows into Gaza, we need to hear from the people of Gaza that they're done, that they understand that Gaza is Palestine, they have no ambitions from the river to the sea. They understand that as people who were born and living in Gaza, they are not refugees from a country in which they never lived. They do not possess this fictional idea of a right of return, which tens of millions of refugees from wars in the 1940s, Ukrainians and Poles and Germans and Hindus and Muslims did not possess. So Palestinians are not special. They do not have a right of return into the sovereign state of Israel. When they declare it clearly in their own voice, then the world can know that it can trust the aid, the money, the cement, the fuel, that all of us can go into Gaza and will go into making Gaza prosperous rather than turning Gaza into a launch pad and a war machine to liberate Palestine from the river to the sea. In that, uh, I read out your four conditions to end the war in Gaza. And again, you are very simple in these. The complete and immediate release of all kidnapped hostages. There might be some breaking news on that in a few seconds. Full and unconditional surrender and disarmament of Hamas. Handing over the perpetrators of October the 7th massacres to justice. And again, what you mentioned many times here in this interview, the abandonment of the, from the river to the sea, the ideology. The fact of the matter is, Inat, that none of these things can be solved without a bloody war. I think it should be made clear that once these things are done, the war ends. The war is not just because of October 7th. We seem to have suddenly lost Inat, which is a great shame. Uh, Inat Wilf, thank you ever so much.